Good morning, church. God is good all the time. Thank you. When we open our Bibles in John 3, verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall have an everlasting love, shall have an everlasting life. Imagine about that, everlasting life. So it's just a matter of just believing in Jesus Christ. So it's time for the announcement. So the first announcement is about the camp. Next week, we're going to Elmo, there's a camp meeting, and pastor will come and give us more information about that. So the next announcement is about The working bee is tomorrow. The working bee is tomorrow here at church at our past eight. So the working bee is all about us coming to church. We bring our tools, our shovels, our cutters, our mowers to come and cut the grass and maybe plant some good flowers around the church to just clean up the church. So we are, we are inviting everyone to come at our past eight and won't be staying for a long time. And the next one again, it's about prayer meetings. So we are having some prayer meetings on Tuesdays at 7.30. So if you've got anything that you need to be prayed for and you want to come for prayers, we encourage everyone to come here for prayers. So what we did, we tried to make life easier for almost everyone. So we've got three Tuesdays where we do our prayers online in the comfort of your own house, over a Zoom link. So we'll send you some emails and the Zoom link. So just keep on checking your emails. So it's Tuesdays at 7.30. So the first Tuesday of every month, that's when we come to church and meet at church here. So I'll call pastor to come and give you more announcements. All right, good morning, church. It's good to be in Pakenham, in a good country. <laughs> um, I will talk to you in a few moments when I get up to preach, but I have uh, just a quick, uh, maybe not so much an announcement, but I need feedback from you. Um, so next week is camp, as Nompilo has mentioned, but we want to know who is planning to be at church next week? All right, we've got a decent, um, a few hands, Okay. Um, just so you know, camp is not where it was last year. It's near Bendigo, so add another two hours onto whatever you drove last year. <laughs> but that's where camp's going to be. We're just trying to gauge. Um, I'm going to ask, this is, this is the announcement part, I'm going to ask that our Sabbath school leaders for um, uh, in here with the adults and our children, if you could just hang around afterwards. We just want to figure out who will be around so... Um, we can figure who can lead out in Sabbath school. So if you could do that, we'd greatly appreciate that. The second question for you all this morning is, following that will be uh, that uh, big camp, the next Sabbath, is going to be the first of the month, the first Sabbath of the month, where we traditionally have our church lunch. We recognize it's the school holidays and maybe some families will be away. Who is, has a tentative idea if they're planning to be at church uh, in two Sabbath times. they got a few hands. All right, that should be enough for us to keep lunch going. We just wanted to check. Um, we'll put an email out with all of the details as to what's going to happen for lunch and Sabbath next week. Thank you for that. It's good to be at home. It's good to see all your faces. And I look forward to sharing with you this morning. But God bless and happy Sabbath. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I um, want to ask you to do something right now, if that's okay. Um, I have to admit, I haven't been in church last week because I wasn't well. But I want to welcome everybody this morning. So I want to ask you to stand up, please. 
<laughs> and we're going to take an opportunity to walk and speak to someone that you haven't spoken to this morning and say, good morning, happy Sabbath, God bless. So I'm giving the opportunity to do that right now. Amen. <laughs> it's, it's good to see the buzz. It's good to see the hugs. Morning, Uncle Ziggy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now as well. I trust that you've had a good week. If you haven't, we know that in Christ we can find strength. In Christ we can find rest. And so this morning before we do a call to worship, I'm going to ask Claudia. Okay, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath that you've given us and the opportunity to come together and, and gather as a family, Lord. And I ask that, um, that you will be with us now during this time of worship and fellowship, that you will still our minds and open our hearts to hear your word. And as we reflect on that sacrifice um, that Jesus made, Lord, help us um, to draw closer to you. And Lord, we pray that our worship will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. As you would have noticed, we are having communion today. And based on that, I'm going to read from Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. I want to read part of a song as well that sort of ties in with that. It says, we remember the price you had to pay. We remember the wounds that made a way. We remember the lamb for all was slain upon the cross. Take of the bread. Receive of the cup, for his mercy is never enough. For the many and the one, come to the table. This is communion. Take it as often as you will, for his blood has power still. By his wounds we shall be healed. Come to the table. This is communion. And so may we take this opportunity today to renew our relationship with God to thank him through our worship for his love, grace, and mercy that covers our iniquities. And may we accept his invitation and come and sit at the welcome table. I'm going to ask you now to stand as we sing our first song, Redeemed. It's hymn 337, Redeemed.
Malachi chapter 3 from verse 8 God says Can men can a man rob God yet he have robbed me and you say in what ways have you robbed you in tithe and offerings It's time for the tithe and I would like to ask the deacons to come and collect the tithe So we got a number of ways of collecting tithe and offerings in our church. The first one is we move with some plates. Then you can either put your money or you can just tape in on the plates. So you can collect some tithe, guys. So the other way, again, it's whereby you can just go to the website. It's called e-giving. You go there and prescribe on the website. It's a very smart one. Even if you are sick or you are on holiday, your money is going to be deducted from your account, which is very good. Whether you are broke or you are rich, <laughs> it doesn't care. It just deducts the money. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give ourselves to you. We also pray that the offering used for the mission fields be blessed so that more people can learn about you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
the reason why we, I suppose we can say celebrate communion, is to remember what God has done for us, the sacrifice he made and the plan of salvation. Um, so let's ponder on what he has done as I sing the next song. Down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day The soldiers tried to clear the narrow street But the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary He was bleeding from a beating There were strips upon his back And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head And he bore with every step The scorn of those who cried out for his death Down the Via Dolorosa all the way stripes upon his back and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head and he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death all the way of suffering
I'd like to ask some deacons to collect the second offering. And the second offering is for the local church budget. That's the money that enables us to pay for the bills, for the water, gas, and electricity. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in Luke 22, verse 7 to 20. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, um, the, t the teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins, for I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do you remember me? After, su after supper he took another cup of wine and said this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you
I'll ask you to stand and join us as we sing our prayer song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And we'll only do the chorus twice, so turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus Christ, we thank you for dying for us. Father, we are coming to you this morning. We are all sinners and we ask you to forgive our sins. Many people have come, dear Lord, to worship you in your house of prayer. We have different needs, Lord, and we ask you through our songs, our prayers, and the sermons to satisfy all those needs that we've got. Dear Lord, we are praying for people who are struggling. Some, they don't have money to pay rents. Some, to pay their mortgages. Some, they don't have money to buy food. Dear Lord, we ask you to provide their needs. Dear Lord, we are praying for the sick. Some they're in the church, some they're in the hospitals, some at home. Also, I'm including in this prayer, dear Lord, my own mom, she's not, she's not feeling well. We ask you, dear Father, to heal all who are not feeling well. Dear Lord, we're also praying for your church. We ask you, Father, to give us love, strengthen our faith, dear Lord, and help us to grow as a church. We're also praying for pastor. He's going to preach for us. May you strengthen him. And we ask you, Lord, to pour your Holy Spirit among us so that we can hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, happy Sabbath, church. It's good to be back home in Australia. <laughs> um, as you may uh, know, today is our communion service, and we're going to do something a little bit differently today. You, you, you guys down for a bit of an experience today? People are looking at me suspiciously. They're like, he needs to go back to America. Uh, <laughs> um, we're going to do something a little bit differently today. Um, Christian is setting up a little table. And um, on it, I am, we're going to celebrate Jewish Passover today. Anybody keen to celebrate Jewish Passover today? Ooh, it's like, I don't know what's going on. All right. Um, so we're going to do a Jewish Passover today. This was something I wanted to do last year when we were going through our Luke series. Thank you, Christian. I'm going to get you to grab those two chairs over there as well. And um, didn't have the time, but I want to do it today. We are 
I'm really excited, just so you know, as we uh, continue along the year, we're going to follow from our Luke series last year, pass this over here, and um, we are going to pick up in Acts, okay, after big camp, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to pull this over this way just a little bit, and um, in my little tray of goodies, uh, all of the the, the requisite things to do a Jewish Passover, okay? But the only thing I'm missing at this point in time is some family, okay? So I have adopted some people into my family today. I'm going to invite them up. There's Jean Latola and Jess. Thank you, Jess. Please come on up. Um, they're going to be in my Jewish family today, all right? And um, please smile at them, okay? Because it's a bit daunting to be in somebody's family. Um, Dean, can I get you to set the table, please? Um, we've got a few different things here. They will all become apparent as we um, go through the service. Uh, Jean, I need you to put uh, maybe three pieces of bread in that plate. And uh, maybe, Jess, if you could pour into... Each of us needs three cups, okay? And I... Three for each of us. And you're going to see, this is in the Bible, right? Who's excited? You excited? Okay, so we're going to do something special today. We each need three cups, and I need you to fill the cups with juice. Uh, or, okay, so whilst they're doing their thing, let's get into it, all right? So we're celebrating Passover. Um, I've been thinking, how do I talk about my trip? There's no time to talk about the trip today, except for this. We're celebrating a meal Having spent almost a month in America, I can see why there is obesity in America. If your pastor spent another month, he may have come back twice the weight he is today. Uh, lots of rich food, lots of sugar. Uh, it was a lot of temptations there. And um, I'm glad I went with Pastor Fraser because he's a strict vegan. And he kept me, he kept me um, on the straight path. Amen? <laughs> All right. Let's get into the service. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads one more time with me as we launch into our Passover meal. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, thank you. You've been a part of this service. We've sung, we've worshipped, we've given back, we've returned to you through our tithes and our offerings. I'm just asking you to continue to be a part of this afternoon or this morning's service. Um, as we sort of walk through the things that Jesus would have walked through some 2,000 years ago, Jesus thought this was really important, and I think there's value in seeing what he was leading his disciples through. So be with us as we journey through the welcome table this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here we have a few different elements um, and we're gonna, they'll become apparent as time goes on. One of my hopes, whilst I'm with you at Pakenham, I would love to actually do a proper meal where the whole church sits down and celebrates communion. I did this once at the last church I served. I'm like, can we try this? And they're like, let's do it. And instead of a church lunch, we did communion. And it's seriously... Arguably the best communion I've ever had, to sit down with brothers and sisters in Christ, people I call family in Jesus, and to celebrate this meal, as it was originally intended to be celebrated. We celebrate with little thimbles of juice and tiny bite-sized portions, but man, this was a meal, it was a feast. And Jesus thought, I need you to catch this, guys, before we go any further. There is meat, by the way, everyone's looking at that. Some people are wishing, I wish he had asked me to sit here. Some people are like, I'm glad he didn't ask me. So it's all good. Jesus, I need you to see this. Before we go any further in this message, Jesus is about to die, right? And thank you, Shenanda, for singing that song because I think it fills out the part of the sermon that I could not preach today, but it tells the story, right? Jesus walking down the Via Dolorosa, the whipping, the scourges, dying on the cross on our behalf. Now, just before Jesus is about to go through that experience, the last things he does with his 12 would arguably be the most important thing that he needs to do, right? When you know that you're going to die, the things that you say, the things that you do, the things that you communicate 
are powerful in those moments, right? And here's the thing. Jesus doesn't preach a sermon, right? Jesus doesn't give a lecture. The most important thing that Jesus will do before he dies is, I need to eat a meal. Can you register that? Have any of you ever placed so much significance on a meal? A meal being the most important thing you need to do before, you know, no one here has died, but if you were going to die, would this be the most important thing that you need to do? Well, Jesus thought that this needed to be done. So Jesus is going to take a meal, which is a 1,500 years old at this point in time, right? And I just need you to see um, the boldness of Jesus, because he's going to take this 1,500-year-old meal and put himself in the middle of it. I don't know about you guys, but my family, we love doing celebrating Christmas. The most significant meal in my family is Christmas dinner or Christmas lunch. Anybody here the same? Now imagine if Pastor Ryan comes to your house and someone's cutting the turkey or the tofurkey, depending who you are, and I say, the turkey is all about me. You guys would be like, get out of my house, <laughs> right? Who is this guy to come into our house and tell us to, you know, how to interpret Christmas dinner, the, the, the Christmas barbecue? I am... The, 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 the sacrificial lamb on that grill. Get out, Pastor Ryan. But Jesus is going to superimpose his experience into this meal. Okay? Now we're going to pick up, we're going to walk through this story. So thank you, Mateo, for reading it. Uh, Luke 22, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we're just walking through the story today. And we're trying to see what a Jewish person in the first century uh, and even to this day, how they would have celebrated this meal. Now, we're doing the truncated version. There are so many layers to this. If we were to do this properly, we'd be here for two hours, and I might lose my job. So Luke 22, we're going to pick up in verse 7, okay? Now, the story picks up like this. It's been, um, just for context, if you remember back to our Luke series, this is Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, it's been a crazy week. All right, And he knows that he's journeying to the cross. So we pick up in verse 7. Now the first day of unleavened bread came on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And so Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. Okay. So Jesus' final meal, it's recorded in every gospel. Okay. There's some seeming contradictions. Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say it was Passover. John says it's the day before. What we do know is that this meal is being celebrated 12 to 24 hours before actual Passover. Now, just remember what Shenando is singing about going down the Via Dolorosa because that night was when everybody would have been celebrating Passover. The Passover lamb is literally killed and people are eating Passover lamb. So Jesus can't do this meal right on the day. Does that make sense? So 24 hours to 12 hours before, Jesus will do this meal with his disciples, which already to them is going to be like, what are we doing this early for? This doesn't make sense. Okay? So this is the context. All right? So we, pick, we continue in verse 9. They said to him, these are the disciples, uh, where do you want us to prepare the meal? Verse 10, and he said to them, when you have entered the city, it's the city being Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Now this gets a little bit uh, James Bond secret spies here. If you read between the lines, okay? Now I want you to read between the lines with me. The city of Jerusalem now has everybody coming to celebrate Passover, the city will swell to about 100,000 people. If you ever go, anybody have any holiday homes or like to go to the beach over summer? You know, when you go to the Mornington Peninsula, we like to go to Marimbula sometimes. And if you go to Marimbula any time of the year, other than like Christmas and Easter, it's dead quiet. And the locals will tell you, come the holidays, it is packed. You know what I'm talking about? This is Jerusalem, packed to the rafters, 
people everywhere, about 100,000 Jews from all over the world, okay? It's a lively environment. It's a festival environment. There's music, there's partying, there's food, there's open doors. So it's a great place to be, all right? Now, there are some interesting details Jesus says in verse 10. He said to them, when you enter the city, there will be a man carrying a pitcher of water, and he's going to meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover, the meal with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upstairs room, prepare it there, verse 13, and they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. What we need to know is that if you remember back to our series or even in your own personal reading of Scripture, at this point in time, Jesus is public enemy number one, right? Remember we looked at how he went into the temple and he he showed everybody how they had been desecrating the temple. They had failed to be God's light to the nations. And, And the Jewish leaders are like, this guy, who does he think he is? So Jesus is kind of keeping low, right? He cannot go prepare this meal, but he's, he's made his arrangements. And why I said this is a little James Bond secret kind of a thing is he gets a guy, he's like, you're going to go into town, you're going to see a guy carrying a jug of water. Do you remember all of the other stories where people carry jugs of water? Remember like when Jacob, uh, you know, when J- uh, Abraham wants his son Isaac to have a wife, the servant finds who's carrying the water? It's the women, right? When Jacob runs away, goes back to where his family from, he sees his future wife carrying water. To see a man carrying water is a little bit weird, right? You see the man there, wink, wink, follow him. Jesus has done some sneaky stuff. He refers to himself as the teacher. The guy knows who the teacher is. Okay, wink, wink. All right, Jesus has talked to me. We're putting this thing together. So I want you to see that Jesus has gone to efforts to make this happen. He's made available a room, a place to celebrate. This is how important it is for him that this meal happens. Can you see it? He's gone to extra effort to make sure, no, everything has to be just right. So we pick up our story in verse 14. When the hour came, so the preparations have been made, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. I had two pictures for you to see today. The first picture is probably the picture we are most familiar with when we think of the Last Supper, right? Hopefully it's there. You guys familiar with that picture? Very famous picture. When I was 12 years, 12 years old, a guy wrote a book about this picture. You guys remember that book? And it caused controversy all over the world and there were meanings in the picture and all this sort of stuff. We often think of this picture, but in a real Jewish Passover setting, it looks something like the next picture. This was low resolution, sorry, but it was the best picture I could find. Passover is an intimate experience with my family at a small table usually, not this big, but probably something like this where we can sit on cushions We're relaxed, we're comfortable, we're with the people we love. I should move this back because half of you can't see. You see over here? Sorry, Grace, you can't see, but they're here, okay? Okay, (laughs) trust me, all right? So it's this intimate environment, okay? Now, this meal is being celebrated for 3,500 years today, right? It's the longest continually celebrated meal that we are aware of. And in this meal, there are four cups that you will drink from. And in Luke's story, three of those cups are mentioned. We think it's just one cup, but there are three specific cups that you drink from as you go through this meal. And I'm going to say a blessing over the first cup. Usually this would be done in Hebrew. You want to thank Jesus that I'm not going to do it in Hebrew because that would be a bit, it might be a bit comical. I need to learn it. It would be sung, by the way. Now, it's a blessing. We are not asking God to bless the drink. In fact, we are going to be blessing God. The Jewish paradigm is not to ask God to bless us. The the, the doxology says, 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so the context of blessing, we're going to say three blessings today, and every time it's directed at God. So bow your heads, we're going to say a blessing. May you be blessed, O Lord our God, King of the world, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. You guys are now free to drink from the first cup. All right. So I'm going to have this one over here. Uh, there's plenty, right? So you'll be okay. So you'll start to drink this through the, the, through the meal. Okay. Now, um, I want to read to you. I'm going to continue reading from our story. So when the hour came in verse 14... He, Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. You can see how important it is. For I say to you, in verse 16, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, this is the first cup, he said, take it this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So he says the blessing, he's drinking, but if you're the disciples, you're like, hey, something strange is happening here. He's taken the cup, we, we, we're used to the cup, but he says, this is a cup that symbolizes something special. I'm not going to drink this cup until I come back, okay? This cup is going to be connected with my suffering. This cup is going to be about what God is doing, his kingdom movements, okay? This is a cup that's going to, it's going to be fully realized when I die tomorrow, okay? Now, you're a disciple, you're sitting down and you're like, um, what's going on? Peter looks at James, James looks at Peter like, is this normal? This isn't normal, okay? This was a very weird meal, and Jesus is so excited to share it. So after you've had this blessing over the wine, the first part of the meal proper is that you will dip carpus, or you'll dip some a vegetable into carpus. Now here is my carpus, okay? I'm going to give this a little swirl. Okay, we've got some carpus here. And you're like, what is carpus? Uh, ladies, I'm going to ask you to grab a piece of, um, um, of the herb. Okay, this is some parsley. Uh, I will grab some as well. Okay, here's, some, here's some, some, some herb. And at this point in the meal, we've said a blessing over our first cup. And what we will do is we're going to dip our herb into this bowl of quote-unquote carpus, and we're going to eat it. Can you do that, ladies? All right. Now, just so you know, yeah, just give it a nice old dip. The carpus is a bowl of salty water. Anybody want to have some salty water and herbs? All right, we're just going to dip that in. I've put lots of Himalayan rock salt in there, so it's nice and salty. Is this tasty, girls? No, it's not, it's not the nicest. Now, at this point, a child would say, why are you doing that? It's a part of the meal. And somebody, Harry, do you want to say why? Harry, why are you, can you ask me why you're doing that, Dad? Why are you doing that? Good question. <laughs> well, and the Jewish tradition is, we're celebrating Passover. And Passover is the deliverance of Israel from which country? Egypt. Well, this is the part of the meal which reminds us of how we got there. Because what happened was some brothers betrayed a brother... They threw him down a pit, and they sold him to some slave traders, right? And they went home, they went to dad, they got an animal, they killed it, and they smeared its blood on a coat. We remember why we got in Egypt, because a brother betrayed a brother. And that salty water carpus is to remind us of that blood, that innocent blood that got somebody in trouble. Interesting, right? Interesting. Thank you for eating some carpus. It's really salty. <laughs> so we continue on, and then another time, a young, the youngest member of the family again is going to ask us a question. 
And say, why, why are we doing this? Carrie, can you ask, why are we doing this, Dad? Why are we doing this? All right, I'm glad you asked. At this point, we will read the whole Exodus story. Who's, who's ready for that? <laughs> Nobody's ready for that. I'm going to read you the abbreviated version in Deuteronomy 26 and verse 5 through to 9. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people, and he lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, our toil, and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's why we're doing this, guys. Now, what I want you to do is, we're not Jewish, but the Jewish person, as you will see, is so strongly rooted to this narrative. And today I need you to be strongly rooted like this is your experience. Okay, could you do that with me? Can you imagine that your ancestors were enslaved? For some of us, that's literally the truth. For literally for my ancestor, they were slaves. But for some of us, it's not the, not the story. But I need you to share in this story as if it were your own. At this point, a psalm would be read. I'm going to read a summary of Psalm 113. And this would be a blessing over the second cup. Girls, you have to finish your first cup because we're doing the second cup. All right, get, come on, hurry up. All right. <laughs> Just poured very generous cups. <laughs> So in Psalm 113, you'd read a Psalm 113 through to 118, one of those Psalms. But in Psalm 113, Israel is a barren woman whom God has delivered from Egyptian bondage. And she's been given uh, a fruitless, uh, she's fruitless, uh, she's been given fruitfulness, sorry, in a new land. God's redemptive work has transformed her fallen circumstances. And God is going to break in and hurt uh, through the pain and the hurt, and, and give her new life. He will redeem what has been lost, and the palm. Uh, the, there's a, the psalm ends with, with a hallelujah. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Father, thank you that in Scripture you transformed the experience of broken Israel. You rescued her in a way that no, nobody else could have dreamed. Nobody could do this in their own strength, but God, you stepped in and you brought fruitfulness in a barren situation. And we remember that. For many of us, we have also been through our fruitless experiences, but you bring us fruitfulness. And so we pray this blessing over this second cup as we remember how you can bring life from nothing. Amen. Hey, feel free to have your second cup. I haven't even finished my first one. Huh? Ooh. All right. So you can take this as your time. Take your time, okay? So um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, had a rabbi, Gamaliel. He's one of the f most famous first century rabbis. And he had a lot to say about Passover. He said, you can celebrate Passover a number of different ways, just as we might celebrate communion differently to Casey, which would do it different to Lilydale, which would do it different to Burwood. I mean, we all can do it a little bit differently. But Gamaliel said there were three things you needed to do. You needed unleavened bread. You need some bitter herbs. We haven't got to these bits yet. And you need a Passover lamb. He said these are the essential things. So we're going to, we, these are all in our meal. Now, when it comes to the unleavened bread, I'm going to read to you Exodus 12, 39, because this is where we see it. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to pre pre prepare food for themselves. Most of us are familiar with this, but this is the unleavened bread. And I've got some, got some at Woolworths, okay? And in Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus prays over this. And when he had taken some of the bread, he gave thanks. Now, the Jewish blessing in English, May you be blessed, O Lord, our God, King of the world, 
who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Now Jesus will break the bread, it says, and he gave it to them saying, and this is where things get different, this is my body, which is being given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. So ladies, feel free to take a piece of bread. This is um, unleavened rye bread. You can buy this. It's pretty dry. You could break a piece off if you like. I'm going to break a piece off here. Okay, there's no way we can eat all of this. Your mouth will be so dry. Okay, so here it is. If you want to try some afterwards, by all means, come along and I'll, I've got plenty. So they will eat this to remind them, right, of the haste of leaving Egypt. Okay. Jesus now, and we're familiar with this, but he is ascribing new meaning, new significance to this bread. This is my body right? I am going to be ripped and whipped and scourged and tormented tomorrow. My body will be broken for you. Can you sort of see how this lands differently as you're sitting at a table and eating it? I know, it, I don't want to say that what we do today has lost its meaning, but I think when you're, you're really sitting there and you're eating a chunk of bread, yeah, there's a lot to think about, right? As you're slowly digesting this meal, you're thinking, you're processing. Jesus thought the most powerful way would be to engage all five of our senses, right? Not just listening, not just hearing, but to engage all of our senses through this process. So now we come time into the program where we eat some bitter herbs. I've, I've warned these girls, there's some, some properly bitter herbs. Now, at this point in the Jewish meal, um, what they would do is they will, to eat the bitter herbs, because the meal was broken bread and bitter herbs with lamb, bitter herbs that they usually, if you go to a Jewish Seder today, you will eat horseradish, grated horseradish. I've got some wasabi here. If you buy most wasabi, <laughs> Dad's like, no, thank you. If you go to most uh, sushi places or go to the supermarket, have a look at the tube of wasabi in the Asian Isle. The active ingredient is horseradish. It's actually not wasabi. Real wasabi costs a lot of money. So if this is being dyed green, it's actually horseradish. Now, I, I've actually been to a Jewish Seder and I sat at the kids' table and I saw these kids piling a big spoon onto a hunk of bread and I'm like, okay, when in Rome, and I hunk this giant slab. And guys, it really induces some tears. Okay. Um, Exodus 1.14 says, They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Ladies, if you want to get some bread, you can put some wasabi on there. Okay. And have a go. I'm going to lead from by example as, as your pastor, and I'm going to take a generous... You don't have to be as generous as I will. Yeah, take a, take a spoonful and put a little bit if you want. Okay, I've got my second cup here to keep me going uh, if I need it. All right. Um, okay, so just so you can see, I've, that's, that's significant. So you can see it. <laughs> okay, now the reason why you put so much is because you really want to engage the tear ducts. I love you guys. <laughs> so, I want you to see this, because this doesn't work if you do a little bit. You have to do a lot. But they do this, because this is exactly what happens. <laughs> um, kids don't do this at home. <laughs> so, this is literally why they do this, because it induces tears. It reminds them of the bitter experience, right? There's a reason. 
I'm okay now. <laughs> the nice thing about horseradish, it's, it's not like chili. It's, it's there for a minute and it's gone. Um, okay? So, we've gone through um, our bitter herbs. We've gone through our bread. But that leaves our final part of the service, right? Some lamb. Can somebody get me a tissue, please? <laughs> so, the final part, is everyone's got tissues ready to go. Um, about a week before, oh, we've got some right here, just in case I break down. <laughs> All right. So, now about a week before, Dad, so in this family, you guys okay? I didn't even ask. You all right? <laughs> they're, they're brave, right? About a week before, Dad would have gone to the markets and he would have purchased a lamb, okay? So, we don't actually have lamb today. We've got beef because um, you can't buy lamb and I didn't want to go to the kebab shop and buy their lamb because that's not nice. But I wanted to get an animal for effect because I think it's important. So you would have picked out a lamb which would have been about a year old and dad would bring it with the family to the temple. Priest would have, would have slaughtered it and caught the blood in a bowl and we take the lamb home. The priests, the priests literally are serving as butchers. Sorry to be a bit graphic, but they're literally performing the function of a butcher en masse. How many people are in Jerusalem? 100,000. How many lambs are being killed? Okay? The salty water. It's all happening, right? The, the priests will, 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 they will do the sacrifice, but they'll also cut it up, and Dad will bring the lamb home with family. Okay? And they catch the blood in a bowl, and it's a very significant part of the, the process, right? God will use that blood, we are reminded, right, on the doorpost of every home. For Egyptians and Israelites alike, and everybody in between, they'd get the hyssop branch and just plaster it all over their doorposts, okay? And if, if you had that over your home, you were safe, Okay? At this point, now we're going to pray a blessing over our third cup. Jesus, we're told in verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten. So they've had this meal. Let's, we can have some lamb if you want to, or beef. Okay, I'm going to take some of this. All right. Who would have eaten this? Okay. At this point, Jesus will say a third blessing over the third cup. May you be blessed, O Lord, our God, King of the world. You create the fruit of the vine. And that's our third cup. Jesus takes this cup and he said, this cup is poured out for you. It's the cup that's associated with this lamb. It's the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Can you see how eating this with this meat you're connecting experiences. I'm not saying it's lost on us without it, but going through this meal really just helps you to think through what's going on. Again, the disciples would be like, what is going on? This is just the lamb that they killed, so the angel of death would not, you know, harm anyone. And Jesus says, no, I am that lamb. I am the one who's keeping you alive through all of this experience. And so kind of concludes our meal. We're going to break up soon, but I really want you to think through this. Jesus was enacting a new covenant on this evening. Covenants are agreements between two parties. And I want you to think, what, if anything, has been my part in this meal? What has been our part? Our part has simply been this, to take and eat, to take and drink. There is nothing that you and I do to make ourselves any better in the process before God. This is 100% the actions of a God who loves you. There is nothing more you can do at this meal to make yourself more worthy. I need to say this to a Seventh-day Adventist person in the room today. Can you hear me? 
There is nothing I do to make myself worthy to eat this meal. The meal is available to everyone. That meal was available to the slave. It was available to Pharaoh. The choice is yours whether you will eat the meal. Some of you may be deep in sin right now and you feel like, I can't participate in this. Friend, there is nothing you can do to change how God feels about you. And somebody might disagree with me on this, but I am very serious about this. If you feel that you want to participate in the accomplished works of Jesus Christ at the cross, this table is for you. If you, we didn't announce it last week because I wasn't here. Some of you didn't know that communion was coming. You haven't had the time to think through your life, to go back and go, you know what? I yelled at my wife. I was grumpy at this person. I have this, you know, this sin issue. And you're like, I can't eat it today because I'm not good enough. The point is you're never good enough. Please understand that. We are never good enough to eat this meal, and yet Jesus offers it to us. Amen? If you did not get to prepare this week, if you did not go through your usual you know, actions, I don't want to say that it's all for naught. I think it's important we process what's going on. I just need us to know today there is nothing we do to make ourselves holy enough to sit here. There will never be anything we do that makes us worthy to sit at this table. It is 100% the complete work of Jesus in our life. This is a grace of God. This is something he does for us, something we could never do on our own. There is no way these slaves could set themselves free from what Pharaoh was doing. I mean, we keep the Sabbath day to remember that God set us free from Pharaoh. Do you know that? Could we do that? No. So if you want to participate, this table is for you. You may not be baptized. You may have been the first time in church. But if you are feeling drawn to the person of Jesus and what he's done for us, then you're, you're welcome to sit at the table today. We're going to break now to wash our feet. There's another part of this service that we didn't explore today. But Jesus says, it, it, he asks us to humble ourselves, right? He asks us to get into the mindset of this meal by humbling ourselves. And so right now, we're going to go wash feet. Uh, next door, some spaces have been prepared for the men and the women. Are there any family spaces? I don't know. I think they're all out getting busy. But next door, is there any family space, Christian, or is it just for men and women? There's an overflow room. Okay. So if you'd like to participate, please come along. We've got things ready there for you to participate in the washing of the feet, and then we're going to return, and we as a community are going to celebrate the fourth cup as a family. Amen? Thank you for being my family today. Now we've got to welcome the rest of the church into our family. So please make your way. We've got some things for families and kids to do here if you want to, or if you need to stay behind. But this is welcome for everybody. I strongly encourage you to reflect on what Jesus has done and wants to do for you free of charge. Amen. Thank you very much, ladies. <laughs> All right. Um, all the kids, all the young kids, I'll invite you to come and sit on the side. We have a little video that's going to play speaking about what God has done for us and the Last Supper. So all the kids coming on the side, there'll be a video being played. Thank you. All right, 
so we are going to watch a story that, thank you, Harry, that speaks about the Last Supper and what actually happened there. Yes, thanks. All right. Thank you, Uncle Graham. As the day of the Passover celebration drew near, the chief priests and the teachers of the law began to look for ways to get rid of Jesus. As Jesus had traveled around teaching and preaching all across the land, many people had begun to follow him, which made the religious leaders worry that they would lose their power. Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples. Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard to come up with a way to betray Jesus. Delighted at the idea of getting one of Jesus' trusted disciples to help them, they agreed to pay him for his assistance. Judas then waited for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when there wasn't a crowd around to witness what happened. On the day of the Passover celebration, Jesus sent Peter and John to find a place for them to have their Passover meal. Jesus told them that inside the city, they would find a man carrying a jug of water who would lead them to a room where they could prepare the meal. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. When the meal was ready, Jesus sat at the table with his disciples. Jesus said to them, I am so thankful to share this Passover meal with you before I suffer. I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the man who is going to betray me is sitting at this table. I will carry out my mission as it has been ordered, but sadness and misery will come to the man who betrays me. The disciples looked at each other and began to question which one of them would do such a thing. The disciples then began to question which of them was the greatest of Jesus' followers. Jesus said to them, Kings selfishly use their power over their people, and rulers unjustly give favor to some. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be humble and serve others. Jesus continued, saying, For who is greater? the person who sits at the table and is served, or the person who serves. It seems obvious that the one who is served is greatest, but I am among you as one who serves. You have stood by me in my trials. I give to you a kingdom, just as my father gave one to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I know, I know, it's done. But I've got a few questions for you. Max, I've got a question for you. What did Jesus serve? Oh, sorry, Maisie, I didn't see you there. What did Jesus serve at the last Supper. Bread and wine. Why did he serve bread and wine? Because that was his last meal. That was his last meal? What did the bread and wine represent? His body. His body. And what about the wine? What did that represent? His blood. His blood. So... Why did he have to do this? Why do you think he did it? 
Yes, Michelle. Did everybody hear that? Did everybody hear what Michelle said? Jesus gave his body. Jesus shed his blood because he loves us. Does he, Harry, does he love you? Do you believe that he loves you? Yes. All right. Peyton, do you believe that Jesus loves you? Yes. Daniel, do you believe that Jesus loves you? Yes. Jesus loves us and that's why he shed his blood. He gave his body to die for us. All right, now I'm going to have a song. Now this song is actually new to me as well, so it might be new to you, but you might actually know it. So I'm going to get you to stand up um, as the song is being played. Let's see, so it's no greater gift than God's great love. What did he give us because he loved us? He gave his, he gave his son. That's right. So we'll do that one more time. I want to see clapping and I want to see the adults clapping as well. Thank you, Uncle Graham.
Now, before you sit down, let's bow our heads and we're going to thank Jesus for his love. Who would like to pray with me? Anybody would like to pray? Michelle, you want to pray? You want to come? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bless everyone and everyone to be doing their Sunday grammar to the world as well. In your holy name, amen. Amen. We're just going to close your eyes again. Just Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you died for us, for our sins, and that you made a bridge to um, the, on the cross so that we can one day live with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord. We love you. And everyone says, Amen. I think everybody's here. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for um, participating in the foot washing. Um, as I mentioned, there are four cups that are usually uh, celebrated at a Passover. Uh, we're only told of three that Jesus blessed in particular. But I'm going to take that fourth cup as a metaphorical cup for our, our family to all participate in today. I'm going to ask Nam Pillow to pray of, over our symbols of bread and wine, and then I'm going to get our, our deacons and deaconesses to distribute uh, the symbols to all. Thank you, Nam Pillow. Remember your sacrifice that you gave. You gave your body. You were tortured. 
the town, the town of Son, would repent. He died for our sins. Lord, we thank you for your body. We ask you, dear Father, to break our addictions to sin so that we sin no more. To break our hearts, hearts so that we can hear your way. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blood that was thrown on the cross. Dear Lord, we ask that that blood may wash our sins. As you are taking the bread and the wine, dear Lord, we ask you to renew our faith in you. We ask you, Lord, to give us our, a new heart, our commitment to go out and spread the way to our friends, neighbors, and all other people. Our commitment to love one another as you commanded. In your holy name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Could invite our deacons and deaconesses to distribute uh, the bread and wine. Thank you. We also have a gluten free option, so if you are, just let us, our people, know. We'll do this first. And as the bread and wine is being distributed. We are going to sing. I'm going to invite you to sing. Let us break bread together. We'll save that one.
Anybody yet to be served? Do you need bread as well? You guys have a try room? Just before we read and partake of these symbols, um, I think it's timely that we're doing this. We don't often get the timing of Easter and this meal at the same time, but it's coming up. And we're not a people who have special dates or we don't say Christmas was, was when Jesus was born. But this is a time when the world stops to collectively think about what was happening. This is a time where you can talk about what this really means to people. I want you to think about that as you partake of these symbols now. We read in Luke 22, in verse 19. He took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. In the other Gospels, they say after this meal, they sang a hymn. And I'm going to invite the deacons to come now and collect the glasses. And we're going to sing a hymn to conclude, and then we'll have a final prayer. Thank you. We can ask you to join in singing Power in the Blood and you can remain seated as our glasses are being collected. Thank you.
Let's uh, bow for a, a final prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, um, we've done something a little different today. We've walked in a very light way through some of the components of that very first communion meal, the very last one Jesus would have, in fact, but the very first of a new type of meal. And as we walk through in a little bit of depth, we have strong reminders of what it is that Jesus did for us. As we dip herbs into salty water or eat things that make us cry, as we infuse all of those things into the other symbols that we have, the bread and the wine, it just helps us to appreciate all the more what Jesus did on our behalf. Father, I just want to pray forgiveness because I know there are many of us in this room, myself included, who have felt at times that I needed to do something to be worthy to eat this meal. But Father, you stand with an open invitation to everybody. I mean, G Judas was present at this meal. And if Judas can have this meal, then I can have this meal. Everybody is welcome. I want to pray, Father, that we are reminded no matter what we do, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus and what he has done. As we head towards the Easter weekend, a time where we often stop to reflect on your great sacrifice, I pray that it would not just be something that resides in our thoughts, but it's something that we live out, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in our lives, and may it be something that overflows into the lives of the people we love, the people we call friends and family. And so, Father, I just want to pray for a blessing over this community. For many of us, we are teachers who are heading to the last week of school and students. I pray that it's a, it's a tidy time where things can just be closed as we head into a season of rest as well. But thank you so much for loving us, Father. Thank you for giving us Jesus. And thank you that he willingly laid down his life for us. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. Just a reminder, if you're a Sabbath school teacher for the older or the younger, please hang around. We'll just have a quick discussion. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Thanks, sir.